So I am Uzi Arnett Chin, and I am the Associate Veterinarian at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to another episode of the Rasafari Podcast. All right, y'all, it is time to feature yet another new facility on the podcast. And this one is a doozy. I am not only super excited to have Cheyenne Mountain Zoo on the podcast, but I'm extra excited because I have an incredible guest from Cheyenne Mountain Zoo on the podcast. Dr. Lizzie Arnett Chin and I connected a while ago, and uh, she's just an amazing human and an amazing doctor and just a fun, funny, awesome person who is, you know, also changing the lives for the better of the amazing animals at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and beyond, which we'll talk about. Um, And I've wanted to have Lizzie on for a while now. And, uh, you know, schedules and life and stuff, they all happen. Um, And then I just kind of recently, like, just kind of randomly reached out and was like, hey, BT Dubs, we should have you on the podcast. And she was like, yep, let me talk to my people. And then came back and was like, my people said yes. And um, so here we are. And honestly, the only thing that that is wrong with this whole thing is honestly, we should have had her on sooner because uh, what a great guest. So I'm, I'm really excited to have such an amazing human from such an amazing zoo on the podcast. Um, and before I let you get to that interview. I just want to take a moment for all this standard remindery type stuff. Make sure you're following along by subscribing so you don't miss any episodes, interview or zoo news, of course. And also uh, make sure you're following along on the socials at Rossafari, at Rossafari Pod on the TikTok machine. Um, and you can support the pod at patreon.com slash Rossafari for as little as three dollars a month. OK, and I think that's really all I've got to say about that. So let's get to it. Here is my interview with Dr. Lizzie Arnett Chin of the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Awesome. And you've been there for a little over a year now. Is that correct? I have. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. I am so excited to have Cheyenne Mountain Zoo on and to have you on. Uh, you and I have known each other for a little bit now, um, and and I think we've been hoping to make this happen. So I'm I'm pretty stoked that we are. Yeah, I'm really excited. I've been been really hoping we can make it all work out. <laughs> so my first question for you before we get into anything else is: Is there any chance that you're going to the AAZV conference this year? I'm not. So I got to go last year. I I know. know. So for the um, head veterinarian and I, we get to switch off every year. So unfortunately, I don't get to go to this year. Okay. Well, you'll have to poke your head vet and tell them to say hello to me. And maybe maybe we'll carve some time because I will be there again this year. So oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah it's such a fun conference. <laughs> I'm it really is. sad I'm missing it. <laughs> it's it's really weird being there as like a non-medical person. Like I'm I'm pretty good at that stuff for a non-vet. I mean, obviously I have the wife, I have all the connections with all of y'all that I've talked to. But man, that stuff goes deep. Yeah, it's it's actually really intense. Like by the time you're done with your day, you're pretty exhausted having to like kind of think through everything. And it's it's so cool because it's like such a higher level of medicine. And then you get to think about it in terms of like your cases and the animals you're dealing with. And like, okay, how am I going to translate to the, the, you know, this to that case that I saw that I was like, ooh, I need something more for this. (laughs) So it's really I always leave that conference feeling so energized and excited. And I come back with like all these ideas and it's just it's really cool to be able to like see in real time the way one conference can sort of change how you manage things back in your own zoo. 
That is really awesome. Have you ever had a moment where you're like, you know, at a conference and you're you're learning medical things that don't pertain to animals that you take care of that have either made you like more interested in a species or like interested in getting a species to your facility or or even just the opposite where you're like, oh, gosh, let's never bring this species in or anything like that? Oh, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so there's we get to do a lot of um, like mega vertebrate stuff um, through like different wet labs and stuff. And I've taken it twice now. And um, before I was at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, um, I didn't get, you know, I had um, elephants when I was at the Buttonwood Park Zoo and I had giraffe when I was at the Naples Zoo, but I didn't have them together. And then, you know, I didn't have rhinos and I didn't have some of these animals that I was really interested in. And that I think is part of why I was so excited about the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, because we have rhinos, we have giraffe, we have elephants, we have hippos, like all of my favorite mega vertebrates. And so like hippos were one of the big ones that like watching some of the stuff that they got to do with them and just being like, oh, that'd be such a cool species to really work with. And nothing against the pygmy hippos. They are adorable. I do love them, but like the real hippos and like, and now I get to, and it's, it's really exciting. That is really cool. And I'm, I'm so excited. Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has such an incredible uh, and diverse population of animals. Um, I, I like to, you know, get into, as, as I'm sure you know, I like to get into the history of my guest a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. So let's start with that. But then, man, I really want to get to the animal stuff. So <laughs> what got you into being a vet? And talk to me a little bit about your history getting to where you are now. Yeah, so um, I was <laughs> I was at the San Diego Park um, Zoo when I was like in sixth grade, and I just remember going around there and just being so fascinated by it and just absolutely loving it. And I was eating lunch with my parents, and we were watching some gibbons. And I just looked at my mom and I was like, I want to live in a zoo. And she was like, All right, whatever. <laughs> and so that's that's where my love of zoos I feel like really started. So I grew up in California. The Sacramento Zoo was actually sort of, well, the Mickey Grove Zoo technically was my hometown zoo. But, um, you know, for the big zoo that was near us, we'd go up to Sacramento or we'd go to San Francisco and Oakland. And so I just, that was always my my happy place. That was where I wanted to go when I was feeling bad. In fact, when I was when I was younger, I had um, my my cat passed away and I was really sad. And so to, to kind of cheer me up, my mom took me to the Oakland Park Zoo. And that was, you know, something that really has always stuck with me. And, you know, as far as, as the medicine goes, my dad uh, was an emergency room physician and my mom was a physical therapist. And so I grew up with medicine all around me and I just, I loved it. We'd always have these interesting conversations. You know, my dad would talk about cases with my mom and my mom would talk about cases with my dad. And and I just, my brain worked that way. Like I, I loved it. I thought it was so interesting. And then when I found out that there were zoo vets, I was like, well, well, that's it. That's all I need to do. So I think I was in, you know, seventh grade when I found out there were zoo vets as well as, you know, just loving zoos. And so I've literally worked my whole life to get to here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And so I, you know, I worked really hard in, in high school to get good grades so that I could go to a good college. And I went to UC Davis for my undergrad and it was wonderful. And I, I worked really hard while I was an undergrad to make sure I could keep my grades up so that I could get into vet school. And, um, it turns out that UC Davis is really hard to get into. Um, it's a large state. And, <laughs> um, so I, I did did apply there twice and didn't get in, um, but I also applied for Kansas State University because I knew that they had a good zoo program, and that was definitely where I was tracking. There was nothing holding me back when I was an undergrad. I volunteered at the Sacramento Zoo, and I um, volunteered at the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito. So I was setting myself up for success as best as I could, um, and I did get into Kansas State. Um, so that was quite a culture shock moving from California to Kansas, um, <laughs> but but it was great. It was a wonderful school. Um, Dr. Carpenter is the, um, the vet that was there. He actually just recently retired. Um, and so I got to learn from him and I just, every summer I, you know, I didn't get to be a tech somewhere and make more money. I just, I did more programs and stuff. Cause you know, when you're, when you're in vet school, you learn small animal and large animal and, and a little bit of zoo here and there, but it's, it's mainly the basics of large animal and small animal. And then you have to take that and translate it into zoo medicine, which is why we have to do so much post-grad work. And so I did that too. I, I got into a small animal rotating internship back in Sacramento because I knew it was probably the last time I was going to live in California, unfortunately. So I wanted to be close to my family. So I got into that and I, I, 
got all the basics down, you know, really learning the surgery and the medicine and all of that stuff that you need to know. And then I did a one year internship with the National um, Aquarium in Baltimore. And that was amazing learning all that. I was starting to track a little bit more towards aquatics. I really, really loved my fish and marine mammals to a lesser degree, but I really loved my fish. And so I was kind of of tracking that way. Um, I did apply for residencies after that. So your typical pipeline into the zoo field is small animal rotating, then a a zoo or aquatic internship, and then a residency. Um, But the residencies are really competitive. There were four open that year. Um, And so it turns out I was not one of the best four people for residencies. Um, But I was able to get a two-year internship with the University of Florida in aquatic medicine. And that was a phenomenal internship. It doesn't actually exist in that form anymore. They still have one, but it's um, completely changed from when I was there. And so um, my first year I was at the Lowry Park Zoo and the Marine Mammal Pathophysiobiology Laboratory. That is a mouthful of a word. Um, (laughs) And that's where, you know, we did all of our um, manatee necropsies. So any of the wild manatees that um, died were transported there. We would do, um, do their necropsies. And then we would all also do any rescues that happened. And most of the rescues that we did then went to the Lowry Park Zoo so I could follow cases through. But while I was at there, um, I, sorry, it, it's now Zoo Tampa. So um, while I, I was at Zoo you Tampa, meant. yeah, I know. Back in my day, it was the Lowry Park Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so then when I was at Zoo Tampa, I was taking care of all of the animals. It wasn't just um, the manatees, obviously under the guidance of the the head vet that was there. Um, so that kind of brought me back to the zoo field where I was like, oh, yeah, I do really love this. Um, and then my second year was the Florida Aquarium and an Aquaculture Laboratory um, through the University of Florida. So it was really cool to get such a diverse um, experience level just in one internship. Um, and so when I was done with that, you know, I was kind of debating, do I want to do a residency or do I want to go ahead and just try to get a job? And I was at a point in my life that I was kind of ready to settle down and try to live my life. <laughs> I had a husband and, you know, so I I did and I, I got a position at the Buttonwood Park Zoo um, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now we I need thought- to pause because mm-hmm. obviously I have a very <laughs> strong connection to yeah. that zoo and specifically to a certain Emily the elephant that lives yeah. there. So tell me about your time at Buttonwood and tell <laughs> me about, you know, Emily. Emily is wonderful. I will Emily say wonderful. Ruth was my heart elephant. Okay, though. well, that's she fair. Was my, mean, she was my pride. You're not a story, drummer. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, Ruth and I had a super special connection. So um, I was there right when we were transitioning from free contact to protected contact. So um, they would walk them around the zoo early in the morning when I was there. And Ruth would knock on my, my window of my office and I'd come out and say hi to her. Uh. And you know, it's really fond memories. I think that the direction that AZA has gone with making sure that we're protected contact is absolutely the right way to go. But I will always sort of cherish that that little connection that I had with her. And I just, I love those elephants so much. And I, I actually really, working at Naples, we did not have elephants at that time. And so I really missed having elephants. So there's just, there's something so special about their soul and just they are a different animal completely than anything else you work with in the zoo and I just I miss that connection that I had with her I still love her to this day <laughs> that's really special yeah I'm uh, I'm actually I've been talking to Buttonwood about going back and and revisiting the girls and and doing some other you know interviews but really for me going back there is all about that connection with with Emily in my case Ruth was great but like yeah. Ruth wanted nothing to do with me yeah. saw the drumming mm-hmm. thing was going on and was like like, like, all right, nah. I'm, I'm out, I'm out. So, yeah, no, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, no, I, I love that too. And it, it was also really different when I was there. It was all um, native animals and then our elephants. I was going to say, so, oh, yes, the, the native yeah. Massachusetts elephant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, black bears and cougars and, you know, harbor seals and stuff that we didn't have. They have a whole new, I think it's South American wing. And they've got all kinds of really cool animals there that I didn't necessarily get to work with, which was a bummer. But, um, but I loved it. Unfortunately, though, when I was there, it was also the worst blizzards that they'd had in, oh, you know, no. I think ever actually on record now. I don't think it's been beat yet. I could be wrong. I haven't lived there in quite a while. Um, 
And, you know, growing up in California and then living in Florida for two years, um, I didn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. That's fair. fair. I love to see food. I love Massachusetts. I love the zoo. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't for me. So um, when I saw a position open up at the Naples Zoo down in Florida, um, I did go ahead and apply for that and was very fortunate to get that position as well. And so I was actually their first full-time veterinarian. So they'd only had uh, contract vets before then. And um, they definitely definitely needed a full-time veterinarian. So I was really glad that they hired me on. And um, so I spent five years there. Um, I built up that program from, um, you know, contract stuff, you know, it's not like they didn't have great healthcare, but it, you know, it wasn't the same having somebody there on property and we built a brand new state of the art hospital. Um, we were working out of what we lovingly called the vet shed before <laughs> then, um, which was a, a it was great. <laughs> it, uh, sure. it presented it presented a lot of challenges, um, but I feel like you know we we were really able to to elevate the level of medicine that they had, and I was able to hand off my position to to another wonderful veterinarian and have her at a higher level than where I started from. And so you know that's kind of when I look at leaving a place, it's always sad because you've made such wonderful connections with the animals and with the keepers. And, and in in my head, what I always say is, is, as long as I've left it better for the next person, that's, that's really all I care about. And so I know that I I left her in good hands. So um, she has a beautiful hospital to work out of. Um, And then I went and did private practice exotics for two years because I I was really burnt out. I had two small children and, you know, it was time to take a little bit of a break. Um, but I also learned through doing the exotics. It, it was great. I got more um, hands-on surgical skills. So, you know, it's one of the big things with zoo vets. We just don't get to do as much surgery as a lot of other places. You know, like if you're doing spleen, you're doing spays and neuters and all kinds of, you know, surgeries. And so I was able to kind of get back into that routine because I love surgery and it's always something that I've enjoyed doing. So I got better at that and, you know, realized that, no, my passion really is conservation and zoo medicine and and all the things that kind of keep you going. Because, you know, being a veterinarian, is it's a hard job. It is not easy. And when you aren't feeling passionate about it, it's so much harder to do. And so it was nice to to know, okay, I tried something different for a little bit, but my heart really is in the zoo field and making sure that I am working towards conservation. And that just made it all the better. And so when I saw the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo open, I was like, yes, please. (laughs) And I have not regretted it for one second. I am so happy to be there. That's awesome. Um, I, you know, I do have a, a question before we get to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo stuff, just off of what you were saying. Um, you know, I know there are still zoos that do the contract vet thing. And um, a lot of them, you know, they're smaller zoos and and maybe they don't have the finances for a full-time vet or whatever. But I'm curious, like, what's your take on that? And do you think that's kind of okay? Or do you think, um, do you think the AZA will eventually move away from that and say that you do need a, a full-time veterinarian? What are, what are your thoughts? on that? Yeah, I think that's really hard to answer. So um, obviously the AZA is going to have, you know, their, their own thoughts on it. I think that for some of the smaller zoos, it can be really hard to, to maintain having a full-time veterinarian. And it isn't that we, that they aren't getting the same level of care. It's that it's just different. It's a different way of doing the level of care that those animals need. Um, I find it very useful to be there every day on the ground because I get to know those animals. I get to know their quirks a little bit. Obviously their keepers know them so much better than I do. And they're the ones that are helping guide me as their, um, as their keepers to know, like they're just a little off today. And what I find, you know, when you're doing the contract stuff, you're usually then also have a different job too. And so that's where it can get a little difficult, making sure you have the time. And and that's where I think it is most important is that if you have a contract vet, you have a contract vet who can come in for emergencies and can be there. And, you know, every zoo is going to be set up differently and have different expectations. And I, I think putting any one idea on another institution is is just really too difficult to do. So, you know, if it works for them and their animals are getting the care they need, then that's all that matters at the end of the day, however that happens to be. Cool. All right. That works for me. So let's talk about some of the the animals at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Um, and, you know, I love talking like veterinary cases, but but what are just some of the like unique, special, beloved animals at the zoo that you can tell me about? All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. 
We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the Lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Um, well, my favorite animal at the zoo is Jumbe, our black rhino. I okay. absolutely love him. He is just the coolest thing. And he also is a little bit scared of his own shadow sometimes. <laughs> and I just find it so funny. That this huge animal that, you know, I mean, is a dangerous animal, could hurt you, is just scared of, you know, a little bit of wind is going on. And actually our silverback, Goma, has a few issues with some wind sometimes too, where he gets a little spooked and you're like, <laughs> you're huge. What do you care? <laughs> oh that's absolutely hilarious um and yeah i always love those things there's a rhino at the philly zoo named tony who is afraid of small birds and he's got a great recall at the end of the day he will go in but if a single small bird lands between him and his space and luckily they're basically blind but if it gets close enough that he can see it he's done and keepers are going to be working late and all like he he is terrified of them yeah. and it is that kind of thing just amazes me so much yeah. <laughs> so um am i remembering correctly it's it's uh been a while since i've looked at, at stuff from cheyenne mountain but um don't don't y'all have tree kangaroos we have one okay yeah. tell me yeah. i'm so i'm obsessed with tree kangaroos yeah. so, so oh, they're tell me about so your tree kangaroo. crazy so her name is psalm she's actually fairly new to us so we did where have, is she from i know that name uh do you I, remember that is a really good question i want to say she's from the no no that's the one that went to denver i'm not i cannot for the life okay. of me remember where she okay. came from sorry no um i could look it up real quick but i don't remember where she actually came from um but we did have uh, Tristan, who was fabulous, um, and we actually got him up to the Denver Zoo, and he now has some girlfriends. So hopefully he will be able to make babies. Um, but the way we are set up, we have um, capacity for one tree kangaroo, which they're solitary animals, so that works out really well if we're not trying to breed them. Um, and she is just wonderful. So she's really taken to our keepers, and she's starting to do um, do more of the you know recall behaviors, and she's really settling in really well so i'm very happy to have her and she's you know, gorgeous and <laughs> she's from lincoln children's zoo i just remembered she's oh, okay. absolutely from lincoln okay. children's zoo and i i'm embarrassed that i forgot I believe for a second. You. <laughs> but i saw her there you know a, a, a while ago and yes yeah. yes yes i i love yeah sam is gorgeous mm -hmm. uh that's so cool um was it intimidating for you because like look i love buttonwood and i love naples they're both huge mm -hmm. friends of the podcast but they are not like huge and like like, you know, kind of like I would say Cheyenne Mountain Zoos generally considered one of the top three to five zoos in the country by like most people that are into the zoo world. Was it yeah. intimidating for you to like chase I mean, after that? <laughs> the short answer is absolutely. It was terrifying. Um, but I mean, I one of the reasons was, you know, with getting so burnt out and overloaded, it's because I was the only veterinarian. And, you know, anyone, even in small animal practice, if you're the only vet, like, you know how hard it can be and it can be really taxing. So one of my big criteria when I was like, okay, I need to get back into the zoo field, but I want to do it right, um, was making sure that I had a team of people with me and I have an amazing head veterinarian to help me out. I've got the tech support that I need. And so, you know, that comes along with going to a bigger and more well-known zoo, which is perfect. And it, we're still moderately sized enough that it feels like a close knit community. Like I know all the keepers, I know who they are. I know their name. I know what animals they work with. Um, whereas when you get into some of the, the much larger zoos, you know, that does get a little bit more difficult. So it was, it's a perfect kind of middle ground for me and is really right where I wanted to be. And I, I was definitely a little overwhelmed, like, you know, we have a lot of mega vertebrates and when you're doing medicine, mega vertebrate medicine is difficult. And so making sure that I had, you know, a team that could really help me work through that and, and have a good system has just been phenomenal. That's really cool. That's good to hear. I, I, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously the thing about zoo medicine that is always tricky and always hard is just 
knowing all the different species and knowing how, you know, they vary and how they're the same and how much we still don't know about so many of them. Um, I can see why having having a team would be a big deal. Um, now, you know, like I said, I, I love talking about animals, but there is a specific type of animal that y'all have at your zoo but only from time to time. And as far as I know, you're one of two zoos in the country that does this. But y'all have dog days at your zoo. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and I, I have so many questions about that. Um, but like, I'm curious what led to the idea to do that. I'm curious how you, like what steps you take to ensure the safety of your animals. And um, also to, to your knowledge, how do animals react to having puppies on scene? Yeah, so um, it is a really unique thing. We just started it last year. Um, I will be honest, I don't know why. I don't know all the behind the scenes stuff that happened to kind of get to the point of creating it. Um, I'm sure that was in, you know, in the works long before I started there. Um, what I do know is that we have a team of behavior behaviorists that you know monitored our species when we started it up so we started it pretty slow and just sort of trying to see how it would go we wanted to make sure that you know obviously welfare is at the utmost importance for all of our animals and something that we take incredibly seriously so we do have a team of behaviorists they monitored everything we watched the animals we watched how they changed the keepers were on high alert like let's make sure we know what's going on um, there's definitely certain areas that the the dogs are not allowed into, like anything where they could come in contact um, with our animals, like the wall of the area. Um, and we kind of monitor them and they seem to do fine. You know, we, we've we watched our primates, like especially, right? They can be a fairly sensitive species um, and they seem to do really well with it. Um, we They seem to be just as curious about the dogs as the dogs are about them sometimes more sometimes the dogs don't even notice that there's you know anything going on around them it's kind of funny to watch um and one of the things that i didn't expect is the amount of enrichment that the keepers would get from dog day <laughs> it's actually one of our favorite days to go out and we get a snuggle on dogs and pet them and every once in a while basset hound will come and everyone calls me and says go out they're here and you know it's, <laughs> it's actually been really it's been a lot less stressful than i thought it was going to be um you know especially as a veterinarian i always worry about you know what what could happen that's just sort of how we're built our entire lives are you know planning for the what ifs and it's just it's actually been really smooth people have been really respectful with their dogs it's it's been a really wonderful thing to see and and to watch the animals interact with them and um it's just it's been wonderful that's really cool to hear. I, I love so Elmwood Park Zoo, which uh, is right outside of Philly in Norristown and is a, a zoo that I am in love with. And I, I, you know, have a great relationship with them. They were the first to start doing it, um, at least amongst AZA zoos. And I know that even like in professional groups, there were a lot of people that gave them crap for it and, and said, you know, this is bad. This is not OK. And they were like, well, no, we like you said, similar thing. We did a slow rollout. We tried it with like staff dogs and stuff, whatever. And, you know, we don't let the dogs go where it, they aren't welcome and all that stuff. Um, and I, I actually noticed that once y'all started doing it, the people that were giving Elmwood Park Zoo crap kind of stopped because Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is a bigger name where people know it. And I, I actually think it really helped and hopefully uh, will encourage other zoos to do it. I've had the experience of taking working dogs and training to zoos a couple of different times. Um, and obviously... You know, these were not dog days and we were the only dogs there um, and they were working dogs in training. So they were very well behaved dogs, but uh, <laughs> very enriching for the dogs, very enriching for the animals. And yeah, you, you could see keepers light up. I always when I'm on tour, I go so out of my way to pet a dog if I see one walking on the streets or like, you know, I, I've probably told the story before, but um, I was playing Galveston, Texas one time and there was a street fair happening. And I had about 10 minutes to get to my venue that was like five minutes away. And uh, I saw that the local, one of the local shelters was there with some dogs. And I was like, oh my God, I need dog time. And I started to run over and this guy stopped me and he was like, yo, it's $10 to get into the fair. And I was like, I literally just want to go see those dogs for the second. And the guy was like, yeah, it's, it's $10 to get into the fair. And by now mm -hmm. I have maybe three minutes before I have to leave. And I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, that's worth 10 bucks. And so I, I, I tossed them 10 bucks and I ran to the dogs and I snuggled puppies for three minutes and ran to my show and, and just felt so much better than I had at any point during that day or possibly week. <laughs> 
<laughs> it it just brings a smile to your face. It doesn't it doesn't matter what else is going on when you get to sit there and just pet a dog. It just makes you happy. It's also so funny to think about, you know, the fact that these are zookeepers who are working with all these exotic animals that most people listening right now would kill to be able to spend some time <laughs> with. And and they're like, puppies. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. And that that is exactly how it goes. We're just like, oh, my God, there's no one. Oh, my God, there's a puppy. Oh, my God, did you see that one? Did you see it? It's just it's I didn't even think about that aspect of it when they were rolling it out to begin with. You know, it was just, OK, we're going to have dogs and we got to make sure the animals are happy. And then just seeing everybody light up when those dogs start coming through the gate. It's like, yep. This is also for us. <laughs> That's so funny. I did not even really think of that angle. That's great. Um, are there any animals that in particular seem to like just light up when the dogs are around other again than the, you know, humans? You know, to be honest, as the vet, I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you would hurt yeah. anything, you know. Yeah, I mean, that would be more from the keeper side of mm. things because I tend to stay up in my little my little office doing all my other stuff. Um um, but I'm sure there are some that that really find it fascinating, and it's it's just such a different way of of approaching things. That I'm. That's one of the things I really like about the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is I feel like they're comfortable looking outside the box, which not all zoos are for various reasons, and I don't blame them either. Um, but I just I really love the fact that we get to kind of try some new things. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Yeah, no, that is that is very cool. And y'all are also, um, you know, and I, I again, I know this isn't necessarily from the veterinary side, but I finally have someone from Cheyenne Mountain on. So I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. Um, but y'all are kind of leading the way with the um, palm oil crisis. And um, yes. you've got the tracking app and all of that stuff. Is there anything that you can say about that? Not even a little bit other okay. than I also use that app and I love it. And I've been using it long before I ever worked here and it's amazing. Um, but yeah, that again, totally different area that I don't, I don't try to put my nose into because I don't know any of the stuff they do. <laughs> That's fair. Yes. You just know that you shouldn't be feeding any chocolate to most of the animals, whether it's palm oil friendly or not. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly the route I go. <laughs> Perfect. But, you know, for those listening, I do want to take a moment, though, right now and just remind you all to make sure that you look up the palm oil scanner app. And it is, um, you know, in conjunction with uh, Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and some other great organizations. But it's a great way to just make sure that what you're purchasing has sustainable palm oil. And that ends up helping orangutans and other animals that live in the areas where palm oil is harvested. So, um, you know, even if we don't have extra behind the scenes knowledge right now, it's still really good to remember that Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is leading the way uh, with that app. And that's something that I think everyone there can be really proud of. Yeah, yeah. And we are. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you ever, do you ever, this is going to be such a weird question, but I'm a weird guy. Do you ever get this feeling like where even the stuff that you're not doing, just because you're part of the organization, do you ever get this feeling of like pride or like, wow, we, we do this. This is cool. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and that is one of the things too, like when you are working at any zoo, right? Like our main mission is conservation. So no matter what realm of it you're in, you're doing your part for the conservation that your zoo is a part of. And so, you know, on, on the smaller level always, and then going into the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, you know, just they do so much for so many different areas. And it is, it's wonderful to be able to say that I'm a part of it. Even if I'm not the one actively doing the conservation, you know, I'm helping take care of the animals that people come to see to then care about the environment, care about these animals, care about the conservation. And that's, that's what's driven me throughout my career and why, you know, while I, I appreciated the two years of exotic private practice that I did, and I was still getting to, to practice medicine, it wasn't where my heart was because that's it's with the conservation. It's knowing that I'm doing my part in something that I love to do to then better the entire earth. Yeah, which is an amazing thing. Um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm curious, uh, is, is there anything, um, and if not, I'll just cut this, uh, but 
is, is there anything that you do um, as far as, you know, conservation organizations or SSPs or SAFEs or just anything outside of, of the actual work at the zoo that you do uh, to further that? No. Okay. That's right. well, I mean, I just wasn't but, sure. Like yeah, people and, do when people don't, and you still have yeah. a huge impact on it. It's just one of those things that I just thought, yeah. yeah. And I mean, one of the things, you know, that it may not be outside of the zoo, but outside of the exhibit animals is that we do a lot of work with black-footed ferrets and Wyoming toads. See, this is and, what I'm talking about. Yes, that totally yeah. counts. Talk all yeah. about this. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So, you know, those are, those are two species that you know, really need help here, you know, and not just like when you think about a lot of conservation, you think about, you know, Africa's a big one, right? Like we know there are animals there that are going extinct, but on a smaller level, like we've, we have these animals, not even on a smaller level, like we have these animals in our backyard that are going extinct. And so being able to be a part of the black-footed ferrets and part of the Wyoming toads, even though it's maybe not on, you know, the same scale as the keepers and, you know, our conservation keepers specifically, you know, it's still, I'm able to help in my way to make sure that they're healthy and make sure that they're able to breed and reproduce to then hopefully be released into the wild and make a big impact in our own backyard. Yeah, that, um, that is something that I find absolutely incredible. The whole re-release thing is, um, it's just really stunning. I mean, to think about that, you know, some animal that y'all helped raise and take care of is now out there doing the thing. Absolutely. And to know that we can make an impact is just, it's such a, it's a different way of making an impact that you actually get to kind of see with your own eyes. You know, when you're talking about, you know, all of this stuff is necessary for, you know, elephants and, and rhinos and all these animals that really help draw people in we don't necessarily see it living here. You know, what we get to see is, you know, we we have black-footed ferrets in the wild and we have these Wyoming toads that are trying to make a comeback. And being able to be a part of that is just, it's so important. And really what, you know, I think makes all of it worth all of it. <laughs> no, absolutely. That is, that is very, very special. Um, you know, you mentioned that you have a lot of megafauna at the zoo. So can you tell me how you have to adapt veterinary like skills to having large animals like that? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so, and this can go for all of them. We want to just make sure that they have the absolute best welfare possible for them. Um, and you know, when you're, when you're dealing with these animals, the most important thing is training. So they help us with their health care. Otherwise, it it's hard, you know, and if we don't have these amazing keepers who do so much training and can get them to help participate, they put their foots, their feet, their foots. <laughs> they put You're their a feet doctor. <laughs> can I leave that in? That was funny. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> they put their you know their feet up for us so we can get x-rays you know their percent ears so we can get blood work on them they are a part of their health care um and and that is the most important thing when you're dealing with these large animals because we cannot you know you can't hold them down like a cat and you know do all the things you need to you have to have them kind of buy into it they have to trust you they have to be a part of it for you um and we have amazing keepers that do such a fabulous job and and we're able to do what we need to with them awake and helping us. And they're happy little participants. They love it. They get all their treats. They they absolutely are a part of their own health care. And that goes for our giraffe and that goes for our hippos. You know, it's all of these large animals. Um, you know, and I think that is a huge shift from the zoos of yesteryear to now. You know, we are having these animals buy into it with us they are you know training and they are doing things and it's all positive reinforcement if they want to walk away they can walk away they don't have to be a part of it and they're choosing to be a part of it and choice is such a big a big part of positive reinforcement for these animals and being able to you know I can get blood work on a lion now without having to do a full immobilization. And that is so important for that animal and for us because we get more information before we could be in a, you know, in a dangerous situation for them um, if they're really sick. And so being able to have them say, okay, this is, this is old hat. I know what to do. Give us their tail. Excuse me. And we can get blood and stuff on them. It, I mean, it's just so wonderful to be able to, to have that with them. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And I, I really love, um, I love that aspect. I know that in, um, domestic, uh, veterinary medicine, there's, you can get fear-free certification. Yes. Yep. I don't know if that's something in the zoo world as well, but it seems to be like 
similar to what y'all try to do in general? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot, there's a lot of crossover between the two concepts. Um, I would say, not to say anything for small animal vets, I love you guys, you're wonderful. Uh, we've been doing it for a while. <laughs> Um, because we have to, you know, it's just, you know, it's, if you have an animal that you need to get blood work on, it's either they're trained and they help you, or you have to put them under anesthesia, you know, and, and while we have really great ways of doing that, and we make sure that they are under the best care possible, anytime an animal or a human or anybody goes under anesthesia, there is risk. And so we now, you know, to benefit these animals, because again, you know, as a veterinarian, as a keeper, our entire lives are just to make sure that the animals are happy and the animals are doing their best and living their best life. Um, you know, that is another way that we can make sure that they are as healthy as possible and that we're not taking unnecessary risks with their health care. Yep. Love that. Um, can you share me can you share me okay i'm leaving that one in too it's okay, only fair you. only fair thank you <laughs> <laughs> um can you share with me a case like kind of from start to finish that that you've you've gone through that has been interesting yes um, <laughs> i mean i can um i'm trying to think you know because a lot of what we do is more um confidential I can I do. You have to respect, you know, animal HIPAA. I think they're called HIPPO exactly. rules. HIPPOs, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so one of, one of the cases um, that I can talk about that I think is really, um, really interesting and super important. Um, we had one of our grizzly bears who broke a tooth. We have no idea how. Um, we came in in the morning and he, he had a broken tooth. Um, so, you know, one of one of the aspects of my job is that it takes a village for all of this, right? So um, our keepers have already had them injection trained. So um, we don't have to worry about taking any um, anything out of their, their normal life, right? To get an injection, to get them under anesthesia. Um, and we actually brought in um, an anesthesia team from uh, Colorado. Um, to come down and do um, do the anesthesia. We had um, a dentist team come in to do the procedure. So we were able to collaborate with so many different organizations in order to make sure that this animal had the best, you know, dental care, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's just for, you know, a dental issue. They have very large mouths and they have large jaws. And so we're able to bring people in that, that have the expertise to do that all while, you know, being able to maintain good quality for them. And he woke up wonderfully, acted like nothing had ever happened to him and went on with his life. And, you know, it was, it was really nice. It's one of those those times where everyone kind of comes together, you know, the keepers did their part. We were able to do ours. We were able to bring the specialists in um, and all for such a great outcome. That is awesome. How does it feel to you as a, a you know, veterinarian to be bringing in people who are experts, but maybe aren't animal experts? And like, do you get nervous about that at all? Or um, how do you feel like, you know, at the end of the day, it's your animal. They're an expert on, let's say in this case, the teeth, but you're the expert on not only the bear, but the animals and stuff. Where where do all those lines get drawn? How do you feel about that? How, like, what's the approach like in the room? Yeah, absolutely. So that is actually, I the way I describe my job is I am like the most extreme generalist ever, right? Like I do general medicine for every species <laughs> other than homo sapiens. Um, so, Which is the grossest one. So. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Um, so, you know, that's that I know a little bit about a lot of things. And so I want to make sure that if I have an animal that's having a tooth issue and I don't feel like I have the equipment even like to get a tooth of that size out, I want to make sure I have someone who does and can do it quicker than me too, right? So anytime you have an, an animal under anesthesia, the faster you can get them done and up is that's our goal, right? So we want to have a nice smooth anesthesia and we want to get them up as fast as possible. And so making sure I have someone who can come in, could I get it done? Maybe, but it might take me five times as long as them, you know, like I want to make sure that I have somebody in there who is in that specialty and knows exactly what they're doing. Because when it comes down to it, that animal is under my, you know, my jurisdiction, right? Like I'm the one that needs to make sure that they are safe and happy and healthy and making sure that all of those parts, you know, it's kind of that holistic medicine approach, right? Like I need to make sure that everything is going well for them. So I'm going to bring someone in who knows how to extract a tooth 
faster than me with the best equipment possible and that I am sitting there monitoring all the other aspects that they don't know about. So I know what medication is going to be best to get this animal under anesthesia. For the most part, we also have anesthesia anesthesia people that will come in and are specialist people. I also have anesthesia specialists that will come in and they also have a good background. So we talk about the case, we talk about the animal, we talk about what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past. That way we have this overall view of what we think should happen. And that way we're a team. So while they may be focusing on a tooth and they're focusing on anesthesia and I'm focusing on all the other little parts, we're getting the blood work we need, we're getting the x-rays that we need, we're getting all these other things. It's us working together that makes it go smoothly and makes it go fast. Cool. I love that. That is, yeah, one of my favorite things is whenever I see these stories that, you know, zoos or aquariums release and it's like, yeah, and these seven teams came together to save this tiny fish or whatever. And you're like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. What uh, would you say is the animal that you work with that like has surprised you the most? (laughs) Guinea pigs. <laughs> really? Guinea pigs? <laughs> Guinea pigs. Oh, my tech is going to just love that I said that out loud. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So we have, I think, about 26 guinea pigs in That's our herd. So um, and, you know, I, I saw guinea pigs in private practice all the time. And, I you know, I loved them. They were great. But then, you know, they went home. And their their owners took care of them, and I I have actually thoroughly enjoyed working with them at the zoo. It's a very different setting; like they aren't, you know, as well. They are as cuddly. I just they're wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> and I really I had not. I was actually kind of like, oh god, I have to deal with more guinea pigs in this job, and <laughs> it's actually been wonderful. And we've been able to to really do some cool stuff with them. So I we actually have like a little. Um, a little ramp area now so they can like go up and run around and it's a little it's not really a bridge but it's kind of a bridge-esque type um build if you ever visit the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo you will see it all set up um and they go I think it's like at 10 o'clock every day and they'll run around on it and it's it's really cute I've actually really enjoyed working with them and and being able to um to see them thrive that's very interesting and very surprising. That was very not, surprising for me as well. <laughs> yeah, that was not what I was expecting to hear. So tell me what it was like. Um, you know, I, I know, I mean, we met through Elizabeth Johnson, our mm-hmm. good, good, uh, good friend and, uh, you know, uh, the host of Mothering Wildlife and all that jazz. And yeah. um, I know that you're really passionate about that side of your life as well. The, the family side of your life. So what is it like balancing being a mother and being a vet? And also what was it like being like, Hey, my Naples family, we're all moving to Colorado now. Yeah, it's hard. (laughs) Um, All around. It's, it was really hard to make the decision to, you know, move my kids who had, you know, their friends and, you know, the daycare that they've gone to since they were born and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and say, hey, we're no longer going to be close to the beach. Uh, it's going to be mountains now. So that's what we're doing. Um, but luckily, you know, my husband had a lot of buy-in with it. And he definitely, he knew I needed to follow my passion. Um, and so he did support me in it. It was also a big question when I was doing interviews and stuff was, you know, he had to also be on board with it because, you know, I love him, you know, whatever. So (laughs) he stayed with us. I know. I know. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So, like, you know, he really liked the area as well. And so he was like, okay, I guess we can do this. And then breaking it to all of my friends was really hard and, you know, a lot of crying. (laughs) Um, And I, and I still miss them a lot. So it's, it, that part of it was pretty hard the job was a lot easier. You know, I knew, you know, I had a, I had a great boss while I was there too, and he knew where my passion was. And so he was very supportive of me moving on and doing what I needed to do to be happy as well. And the balancing of the life, um, that, that has been tricky for sure in every aspect, you know, and, and I think that just goes along with being a parent. It doesn't matter what job you're in. Um, I know when I was at the Naples Zoo, you know, I had a lot of, I had a decent amount of support there for being a mom and them understanding sometimes I kind of had to go do stuff, but being the only vet, it was really hard. You know, if I could, like one of my son's birthdays, I had to rush back to the zoo to, to deal with an emergency and, you know, it's stuff like that, that just 
it, it's hard. It, it is. And that was part of why I was getting really burnt out, you know, just always being on call and, and having to do all of that. And, you know, but private practice also was kind of difficult. I had a point. And since so if my son was sick, it wasn't nearly as easy to just say, Hey, I can't come in today, you know, cause everything would have to get rearranged. And, um, here, you know, not being the only bed has made it a lot easier. And I, you know, I have a wonderful boss who is like, yeah, I get it. You have kids. Sometimes you have to say, I can't do this. And luckily we have people that can pick up the slack if you have to go do something, you know, and it's just so nice having that community to be able to say, no, we get it. You don't have to feel guilty about it. We will make this work because we know when we have that issue, you will make it work for us. And, you know, we just, that's how it's been going. And it has been absolutely wonderful having that support and, and just really being able to, to let go sometimes and be able to just focus on my family. It's been wonderful. Good. I'm glad to hear that. That's really awesome. Uh, are there any conservation organizations you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously just going to your local zoo, right? So every zoo is going to have the conservation stuff that they are most attached to. Um, and anytime you walk through those doors, that's where your money is going to go towards. So, you know, just going to your zoo in general, but one of one of my favorites is the Sabo Trust. Um, so they do a lot of work out in Africa helping elephants. Um, but they also have rescue for, you know, orphaned and injured animals. And they also do a lot of community outreach. So it's one of those organizations that I feel is really holistic in their approach as well and really, um, really helping to, to move that bar forward. Very cool. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Ron Safari poop story. <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually joke around about the fact that like there's probably more pictures of poop on my phone than anything else. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, one of one of my favorite stories to tell though is actually from when I was an intern. Um, at the Marine Mammal Pathophysiological Laboratory. Hey, you said uh, it right this time. I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a mouthful. I always have to like read it to say it right. Um, but you know, the Marine Mammal Path Lab is basically what we call it. Yes, yes. Um, and so uh, what you may or may not know is that when manatees die, um, especially in the heat of uh, Florida summer, um, it can get kind of gross. And one of the things that we, you know, through all of the necropsies have done, have learned is that sometimes you have to use a garbage can lid as a shield when you cut into them because they will have their intestines explode out of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Mm -hmm. oh. So if you're ever doing a necropsy on a manatee in the heat of a Florida summer, be warned. Wow. That's uh, food for thought. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm so glad we finally got to. I know. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be able to, to talk about my amazing job. I love it. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to tell you all that uh, that does not make me want to go to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo uh, any less. It, it really is not helping me with my FOMO right now. I want to get there so badly. And also, like, just hearing all the little things that Lizzie knew a little bit about, but like, you know, other people there are experts on, I feel like I could do so many episodes featuring the amazing work at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and uh, we would never really have to stop. What an incredible place. Ah, loved that. Loved that so much. Um, I'm also really grateful that, you know, especially for being a first time guest, uh, Dr. Arnett Chin there letting us leave in a little bit of the misspeaks and a little bit of the humor uh, is always appreciated. So, yeah, had a good time with that. Uh, I hope you all did as well. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. Don't forget to be back here on Friday for another episode of Raw Safari Zoo News. And hey, don't forget the word credits backwards is, wait for it, 
Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.